to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ and jesus increased in wisdom in stature and in favor with god and man luke chapter 2 verse number 52. welcome to our study of the gospel of luke as we think today about Luke and his message of Jesus as the ideal person, we think about Jesus' humanity and his deity combined as the Son of Man and Son of God bringing salvation to the world. We welcome you today to the Gospel of Christ broadcast. We're so glad that you've joined us in our study of the Scriptures together. Our aim is to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, Verse number 15, as always, these lessons are being broadcast or being brought to you on our website as well, thegospelofchrist.com. You can download those or you can request free CDs and DVDs from our website. And as always, we hope that if you've got a Bible question, something maybe that you're considering scripturally, that you might call or email us and we'd love to communicate with you about those questions. The Gospel of Luke is unique from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John on several different levels. As you remember, the New Testament can be broken down into four unique categories. Matthew through John are what we refer to as the Gospel of Counts. They tell us about the life of Christ, who He is, what He did, and how He ultimately suffered and died and was resurrected for us. The second category is the book of Acts. Acts is all about what must I do to be saved and how one becomes a Christian or a child of God. Then that third category, Romans through Jude, tells one now that you are a Christian, how do I live faithfully to the Lord? What is my daily life? What are my decisions? And how do I live for Jesus each and every day? And then that fourth category, Revelation, tells one how to die victoriously, be faithful unto death. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10. Now, of the four accounts of the life of Christ, each of those is even unique. For example, Matthew is written to a Jewish audience in which he is trying to convince Jewish readers, mainly from the Old Testament scriptures, that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy and King of the New Kingdom. Mark is unique in that he's writing to a, a Roman audience and a Roman mind who are all about action and power and, and majesty. And so Mark tells us Jesus has done all things well. He is that majestic one. Mark 7 verse 37. John is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke in that it is not a chronological picture of the life of Jesus. It's more of a didactic. That is a teaching gospel with the main theme, Jesus is the Son of God, and then hand-picked evidence to prove that. Now Luke is unique in that Luke is writing to what we believe is a Greek audience and the Greeks had this mentality of the ideal man. The Greeks were searching for ideal human being in every way. Uh, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Homer's Odyssey, many of the Greek statues depict great human specimens. Well, their ideal human being for the Greeks was considered in perfection as intellect or wisdom, stature or physique, and be socially acceptable. Luke now adds another dimension to that. Luke writes to show Jesus not only meets their criteria, but exceeds them and adds another dimension to the ideal human being, that is, Jesus increased in favor with God. And so listen again to Luke chapter 2, verse 52. Jesus increased in wisdom, there's intellect or wisdom, stature physically, favor with God, there's that fourth dimension, and man socially. And so Luke adds that spiritual dimension in just as well to show that Jesus exceeds 
the ideal human being from the Greek standpoint and adds that spiritual dimension as well. Now, key word to the book of Luke is the word son of man. This occurs 23 times. Jesus is often referred to as the son of man showing his relationship, his humanity, and that he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4 verse 15. And thus Luke writes to show an orderly account so that men may know the certainty of the life of Christ. Luke chapter 1 verses 1 through 4, much like the beginning of Acts chapter 1, here we have the writer writing to Theophilus to convince him of the certainty of the things Jesus said and did to prove his humanity and his deity for all mankind. Key verses, Luke chapter 2 verse 49. Jesus has got lost from the crowd, separated from the crowd, even separated from his parents. They go searching for him. They find him in the temple. And Luke 2 verse 49, when they question Jesus, in essence, where have you been? Why did you leave the family and your parents? Jesus said, did you not know I must be about my father's business? And then that verse that shows us the great mission and mindset of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Luke 19.10, Luke records Jesus saying, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Combine these two ideas. Jesus said, I've got to be about the Father's business. Well, what is the Father's business? Seeking and saving the lost. Friend, aren't you glad? Today, Jesus was about the Father's business. Aren't you thankful that Jesus came to seek and save the lost? Because that includes you and me. All of us, at one time or another, have indeed been lost. Now, for just a few moments, let's highlight some of the ideas. Let's show some of the powerful passages, main images, and things that we find in the book of Luke. And then in the rest of the lessons, we'll go in more in detail some of these ideas. What are some of the main ideas from Luke? Luke presents Jesus as the eternal King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who is of David and fulfilled prophecy. Look in Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33. The scripture says of Jesus, he'll be great, will be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He'll reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there'll be no end. Here we see Jesus of the lineage of David, 2 Samuel 7. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 14, God promised and prophesied to David that one of his seed would reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of that kingdom there'd be no end. Well, who is that? Friend, it's none other than the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is of the lineage of David from Matthew chapter 1. His kingdom is that eternal kingdom, Revelation 11, verse 14 and 15. And currently, presently, He is King of all kings and Lord of all lords, Revelation 19, 16. He is reigning at the right hand of the throne of God, Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 4. And so Luke presents Jesus from the outset as that eternal king of the eternal kingdom, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 16, 18 and 19, Acts 2, verse 47, and Mark chapter 9, verse number 1. You know, another powerful lesson that we learn from the Gospel of Luke is about the power of the Christian and his giving back to God. Now, friend, I want you to stop for just a moment and think about the all that God has done for us. James 1 verse 17 puts it this way, Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow or variation of turning. Everything we have comes from the hand of Almighty God, and in view of that, Luke encourages us to be good givers to God. Look at Luke chapter 6, verse number 38 with me for just a moment. And notice what Luke here writes or records Jesus is saying. 
Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom, for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Here's a very graphic image about how we ought to give, and the image is maybe that of some farmer out with a bushel about to go pick something in the field. Uh, for example, maybe you've been to a farm or a place where you bought a bushel of peas, and when you go out to buy those peas, they tell you up front, you take this basket, this bushel, and as much as you can get in it is this price. Well, how would you do that? Would you just fill the bottom of it up? Well, of course not, not and get your money's worth there. Would you fill it halfway up? No, that wouldn't be right either. Would you just put it almost to the top? No, you'd take that basket and you'd fill it up, then you'd press it down, you'd shake it together, and you'd get as much in there as you can. That's the sense of how we ought to give. Give. What do you mean? Give and it be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and put back into your bosom. This is not a, a health and wealth gospel, but it shows that if we have the heart and the attitude that we want to give as we've been prospered, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, if we're a, a cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 7, then friend, you couldn't find any better cause in all the world to give to than the cause of Christ, and God's going to take care of His own who seek first the kingdom, Matthew 6, 33. They're not going to have to worry about food, shelter, and clothing. And so Luke encourages us to be good givers to the cause of Christ. Then as we think about the book of Luke, we're also introduced for, to a very unique passage about baptism, one that I rarely hear used when we think about, what about all these people who aren't baptized? What about those who reject baptism? I hardly ever hear this passage used, but it is a powerful one. Look in Luke chapter 7, verse 28 and 29. The Bible records these words. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now notice this. And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. Now notice, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. What do I learn about Baptism and its significance and importance here to fail to be baptized correctly for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, in the right way by immersion, Mark 1 verses 9 through 11, or to be baptized at all is a rejection of the will of God. Those who failed to be baptized in this text were told they rejected the will of God, meaning that God had said it and in essence they said, no, we're not going to do it. They were viewed as rebellious and rejectors of God's will. Friend, baptism is indeed an essential part in God's plan of salvation. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark 16, 16. Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water in the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. John 3, verse 5. Peter said, baptism does now also save us. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. And so, in view of all that the Scripture teaches, and these are just a sampling of the passages, but in view of everything the New Testament teaches, someone who says, I was saved before baptism, or baptism has no significance, or you can be baptized or not be baptized, it doesn't make any difference. According to Luke 7, verse 30, just like the Pharisees, that person is rejecting God's will from on high and will have to give an account of that on the day of judgment. Now let's turn our attention to another very unique passage in the book of Luke. And, and this is where we learn about the power of God's Word. You know, when you think about the Bible, there are, are several images that show its power. For example, Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, the Word of God is alive and powerful. What do you mean living and powerful? Sharper than any two-edged sword. Take a knife or a, a sword and sharpen that and, and shave the hair right off your arm. 
Word of God is sharper than that spiritually. The Word of God is that which by we're born again. 1 Peter 1, verse 23 through 25. James said in James 1, 21, we're to receive with meekness the implanted Word, here's the power of it, which is able to save your soul. And Paul said the Gospel is God's power unto salvation. Well, how is it that the Word of God is so powerful? Here's how. The Word of God is that seed from which the Christian and Christianity springs forth. Look in Luke chapter 8, verse number 11. The Scripture records of the Word of God very simply in Luke chapter 8, verse 11. Now the parable is this, the seed is the Word of God. Oh, we're talking here about that which from which life springs, that which from growth comes, that which from something maybe that was dead springs up again. How does someone who's lost in sin, Romans 3 verse 23, someone who's headed down the path, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, he's made alive, Ephesians 2 verse 4, how does that happen? My well, friend, it happens by the seed being planted in a good and honest heart, that's the context of Luke chapter 8, you've got the four souls, the seed's the Word of God, it must have a good receptacle, a good and honest heart, and then it can bring forth fruit to God in this life. And so as we think about the Word of God, let's realize its power and its potential, but let's also realize this, we've got to have the right soil. I've got to have a good and honest heart. I've got to be ready to receive it. I, I've got to be willing to make changes. I've got to break up any fallow ground, and I've got to decide to put God first in each and every way in my life. And so are we accepting the Word of God? Are we putting it to use in our lives? Is our soul ready to receive that which God gives? You know, another powerful text in the book of Luke that kind of highlights one of the great messages in this account, we ask the question, are you a Mary or are you a Martha? And you're thinking, what in the world is a Mary or a Martha? Well, let's hear the story from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Notice Jesus uses this example. The Bible says, now it happened, as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard His word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached Him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things, but... One thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. You know, I, I hear this story, and I can see it. You can see it kind of from both sides. If Jesus, if you knew Jesus were coming to your home, I know what we'd need to do first. We might want to straighten up. We might want to get something ready to serve him. Might want to make a jug of tea or, or have some cookies there. Make sure everything's picked up in the house. And so here you've got Martha and she's distracted with much serving and it's almost humorous. We learn that Mary, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus, Jesus learning. But Martha has the audacity to come to Jesus and here you've got the sibling rivalry and some bickering going on. You just thought that happened when they were young. Here it is again. Martha comes and she says, Lord... Do you not care that my sister has left me, in essence, in the kitchen alone, and I'm out here doing all the serving? Tell her to help me also. Now, can you imagine saying that to Jesus? Tell my sister to get up and come in here and help me fix these cookies or help me straighten up a little bit. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted about many things. Now, listen to this. One thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Friend, both of these things were good. It, there's, it's good to serve, and it's good to sit at the feet of Jesus and study, but if you had your others, which would they be? Jesus emphasized, Martha, Mary's chosen the good part. Sitting here, studying, 
learning about salvation, not being busy and distracted with so many things. That's, that's not what's important. You need to focus on learning about me, learning about the way of salvation, and really giving yourself to the Word of God. And so don't get so distracted by life. Don't get so distracted maybe even with good things, serving others, that you forget to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn from Him. That's the really important thing in this life. Let's turn our attention now to another man in the Bible, another individual in the Bible who made a very poor choice. We learn about the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. Listen to these words. The Bible says, And Jesus said to him, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no more room to store my crops? So he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater, and there I'll store all my crops and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now watch this. But God said to him, Fool, this night will your soul be required of you. Then whose things will those be which you have provided? Now here's the point. So is he who lays up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. You can imagine this scenario. Any farmer can see this. Have a great crop year, so much so that you can't get it all in the barn. And so what do you do? You say, looks like I'm not to build bigger barns. Nothing wrong with having a great crop year. Nothing wrong with necessarily building bigger barns. Nothing wrong here with this man and his industry and his business skill. What was the problem with this man? His failure to factor God and his own soul into his decisions. He said, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And you know what God said to him? You fool, this night will your soul be required of you. What was the point? Like Martha, this man was distracted. He was distracted by his farming. He was distracted by his great crop year. He was distracted pulling down barns and building barns. And you know what he forgot to do? Take care of his own soul. And here's the point Jesus makes. So is he who lays up treasure for himself, but is not rich toward God. Friend, there's a very, very powerful lesson here, and it's this. My soul, your soul, Martha's soul, the rich man here's soul, that's the most important possession and treasure you've got. Do you remember what Jesus said in Mark 8, verse 36 and 37? What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Friend, let's think honestly for a minute. I believe some people, like Martha and like the rich fool, intentionally busy themselves with so much stuff and junk in their lives that they just say, I don't have time to think about that right now. I don't have time to study the Bible. I don't have time to think about my soul. I don't have time to think about eternity. God says to them, you fool. And how do you know? Your soul won't be required of you tonight. James 4 verse 14 says, what is your life? It's but a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. And so we desperately need, desperately need to make sure that we're right with God. The things of this world cannot please us in the end. Do you remember the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10? Came to Jesus and he said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Great question. In essence, what do I need to do to be saved? Jesus said, Keep the law. Do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery, honor your father and mother. All these I've done since my childhood. One thing you lack. Uh-oh. What is that? Go, sell what you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. You know the rest of that story? The Bible says the rich young ruler went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He let his stuff and his junk and his possessions keep him from having eternal life. Friend, don't let that be you today. 
Don't let the things of this world, the joys, the pleasures, the, the, the busyness that we all have, don't let that get in your way of going to heaven. More than anything, God wants you, we want you, Christians want you to obey the gospel. And so I want you to think about yourself. Are you a Mary who's ready to sit at the feet of Jesus, put everything aside, put first things first, and learn from Him? Or are you like Martha? Martha was a good person. She was serving. She was doing good things. But she was so distracted by serving and life and all the other busy things. She overlooked the most important. Or are you like the rich fool? So busy building up treasure here and taking care of stuff here and busy with the day-to-day -day task here that you fail to think about your own soul. Friend, I can promise you this. If the time is not made now to think about your soul, when will you make it? You won't make it on the other side. Eternity is forever. This is your one and only chance. We urge you to make it right. And so what does the message of Luke teach us? It teaches us the power of Jesus' humanity, what He did for us, and, and how that we can have the hope of eternal life through Him. If Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost, I need to realize I am. You are. We are. That which was lost. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 There's none righteous, no not one, and thank God that He came to save us. And friend, let's think about our own soul. What must I do to be saved? You've got to hear the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17 You've got to believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6, John 8, 24. You've got to be willing to repent and turn back to God. Luke 13, verses 1 through 5. And you must make that good confession and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. On the day of Pentecost, they asked, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And here was the answer. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Friend, if you've never done that, why not do it today? Why not put first things first, take care of your soul, let the rest fall into place, and make sure, more than anything, make sure that you're right with God. We hope you'll join us again as we study more about the gospel of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788 McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.